Hello everyone, good morning. Very happy to be with you today in Singapore. We're going to talk about buildings. I'm Laurent Bataille. I'm the executive vice president of the Eco Building Division, which is the controls and automation business of Schneider in buildings. And today we are going to talk about how, in the digital economy, the progress we have on IoT technology, mobile, software, gives us an opportunity to transform the way buildings are built, but also the way buildings are run. Singapore, in that regard, is a great background, beautiful city with great buildings. And we will see that many of the trends that apply to other cities are true here. So first, let's talk a bit about the trends and the challenges that we see coming in the coming decades. One of them, and one of the most significant ones, is urbanization. By 2050, we will have 2.5 billion people moving to cities. It is the largest single move of urbanization in the history of mankind. Big impact. If you think about what it means, it means every year erecting from scratch the equivalent of 15 times a city like Singapore. Why is it a challenge? It's a challenge because it's going to have big implications in terms of the way we use space. There's going to be space scarcity, of course. And local authorities will also drive up regulation in terms of standards so that we have the right level of comfort in buildings whilst using less resources. Second very big trend is actually digitization. In 2014, we had historically, from the beginning of time, connected 1.7 billion devices in buildings. By 2020, this is going to triple. We're going to be beyond 5 billion devices connected in buildings. So it's going to, I would say, enable lots of innovation, capabilities for us to cross data from very different systems, come up with more insights. We're going to have to leverage machine learning, artificial intelligence. However, it is also a challenge. Because the largest part of the building stock is already installed. And in many of these buildings, gathering the data, organizing, structuring the data so that we can harvest it, make meaningful sense out of it, won't be easy. The third big trend for us is certainly the energy dilemma. You see here Singapore. Buildings today consume 60% of the electricity in the world. And we estimate that in the 20 coming years, by 2035, actually, the need for electricity is going to increase worldwide in a conservative scenario by 60%. At a time where we're talking about climate change and all the issues going with the need for more energy, it's going to drive real changes in the way our buildings are run. We're going to need much more renewable sources probably decentralized, like solar, with storage. It's also going to mean that your buildings will become generating assets. And we will need to make sure they can connect, disconnect from the grid, so that you have a lot of intelligence to handle powering up your building. So all these trends create challenges and are constraints applying on our cities and on the buildings that are the bedrocks of our cities. Now let's turn to the situation that we can see today in buildings. It looks like that. It's a data chaos. In buildings today, and in an historical manner, the way we were installing buildings, data is either trapped 
in silos with OT systems that don't talk to each other. Data may actually be very difficult to extract because we don't have what we would call data highways installed. You're not necessarily in the past using IP technology, so you have limited data bandwidth. You cannot get the meaningful data you'd like to have. It's a big issue because a big part of building costs are in the maintenance side. 75% of the lifetime cost of buildings are in operations. And if you cannot make sense of the data, you are poorly running your operation. You don't know where the faults are. You don't know where the opportunities for improvement are when you're facing such a data chaos. So to really invent the smart buildings of tomorrow, the big priority is to have meaningful data. Gather it at ma mass scale, be able to cross it across systems, really drive inside out of it. So that's where you see data building up smarter buildings and smarter cities. We know for a fact when we do that, i.e. when you have modern platforms running buildings, you have great outcomes. We can drive down the number of complaints linked to discomfort by a minimum of 50%. You have great gains in terms of energy efficiency at a minimum 30% of gains. You can also have a big impact on how people feel in buildings because to their poor ventilation, if you improve it, can drive down your number of sick days by 35%. There's all the question of space. You know, very recently, a Fortune 500 company did actually a test in many of their US buildings and found out that half of the space they had and we're running was underutilized or not utilized at all. So we know when we have the right data, we can make better informed decisions with great outcomes. Now, what are the main values we can deliver in new buildings? The most important one in the future is actually make sure our buildings are more engaging. How do we do that? I mean, just think about it. When we, when we talk about more engaging and comfortable buildings, better places, more productive places, we can go back to some very simple facts. Today, according to the World Council for Green Buildings, with better ventilation, on average, you can drive up to 11% more productivity of employees in office buildings. With better lighting design, up to 23% more productivity. Simple things, but certainly when we operate in a comfortable, nice environment, we are certainly more productive. It has an impact on customers of certain businesses. Think about hotel chains. Think about patients in hospitals. So that's very rapidly becoming the most important parameter for users in buildings, which is make sure they're engaging. Then we turn back to more traditional values that building owners and developers are expecting. Of course, one of them is efficiency. But with modern technology, we should talk about hyper-efficiency. You know, there's already a lot of smart systems in buildings, building automation, but the reality of the revolution we have in front of us is that we are going to actually drive unheard of levels of efficiency. Thanks to big data and artificial intelligence, we will just push the limits of efficiency. I'll give you a few examples. Certainly, the energy dilemma and the need for sustainability is here. We see more and more accreditations that are needed in order to make sure the buildings are operating at a certain level of energy efficiency. Actually, right now, there's a lot of work, for instance, in uh, the European Union about making sure we mandate a certain number of indexes 
in terms of how energy efficient buildings are. Finally, any transformation or revolution needs to happen at scale. If we want modern technology to transform our buildings at scale, we have to make sure that transformation is efficient. I.e., when you rip off old systems and you put new systems, we have to make sure this is done in a very cost-effective and time-effective fashion. If not, people will always hesitate to go with the new technology. And the reality here is we can do that, and we have the proof of that. Let's go to more engaging buildings. You know, we are talking here about simple things. It starts with comfort. Today, with the right analytics that we've, for instance, deployed in a very large airport in the region, on top of an existing BMS system, so it's an airport that is already running with a smart system, we are putting the right level of analytics on top of that, that is driving new insights. Year one, we could drive down the complaints linked to discomfort in the airport by 80%. Year two, an incremental minus 50% of complaints. So you see how relatively basic things like comfort in building can really be improved with new technology. Now beyond that, there's a whole new universe, if you want, with productivity gains and satisfaction of people in buildings, not just basic comfort. I'll take two examples. In hospitals, nurses' crews are very exposed to stress. You know, they have uh, jobs where they need to juggle with many different informations coming from various sources, the asset tracking system, where are the important equipment, are they in the patient room, etc., etc. Then there's the charge-discharge system for the operating room and operating theater. There's a lot of information about the patient rooms. So a lot of conflicting data from various systems. We know for a fact that with these various OT system integration, we can improve the job satisfaction of nurses in hospitals a big way. We've done it in a few hospitals. One of them, for instance, is South Australia Health and Medical Research Institute, summary. Um, but right now, we're also working in what will be probably the most connected hospital in the US, uh, in Pennsylvania. All that has a big impact on the employees in these buildings. Job satisfaction, less churn, less turnover in the teams. Very important when you have war for talent to make sure your employees are satisfied in the buildings they're operating in. Another example, it's a bank, uh, Société Générale in France, uh, when they've actually moved and consolidated many buildings they had in the Paris region onto one new campus in a new building of 76,000 square meters for 5,000 employees. They've actually deployed an analytics package from Schneider service, which is called Workplace Advisor, that you can see it in the Innovation Hub. And thanks to the app that are actually helping employees to find parking spots, find their ways in the very big campus when it comes to finding meeting rooms, understanding the pattern of queuing at the restaurant, etc., the HR department of the bank is actually reporting a year later that on average, each employee has saved more than 20 hours per year of productive time. If you don't call that productivity gain, so big impact. But on top of that, interestingly enough, they also see that thanks to this technology and this digital engagement in their building, they manage to attract and retain better their millennials, which for them is a very important target for the future of the, of the bank. So another example of how much it's important to come up with more engaging buildings. Now let's move to hyper-efficiency. Here I will just take one example of how much we can drive better efficiency thanks to new technology. 
taking another uh, airport example, actually in Australia, so a large airport where we've deployed our analytics on top of an existing BMS system. What these analytics do, building advisor, is actually it's a digital twin. We are running in parallel an optimized modeling of the local installation on the cloud with actually the real system with, with real data gathered on site and we compare it real time. And thanks to that, we managed, on top of a very smart system that was already there, to drive 15% more energy and maintenance efficiency gains. So that's really where you see we can raise the bar in terms of efficiency. That's why we call it hyper-efficiency. Let's move to sustainability. With climate change constraints, and the need for additional energy and electricity in buildings, it is very clear that buildings will not only be energy-consuming assets, but also energy-generating assets. They are going to be generating assets in the mesh grid. Typically with solar, decentralized generation, local storage, power monitoring and control capabilities to move from a source, the grid, to their internal source, either storage or their photovoltaic panel. This is a reality. We already see that happening. Actually, we're working with the northern European retailer to make sure their warehouses have these microgrid capabilities tied with the demand side management that is handled by the BMS. Here you actually see the Schneider headquarters in the Paris uh, region. 2,000 employees, 35,000 square meters. Over the past eight years, we've driven down the net energy consumption of this building from 150 kilowatt hour per square meter per year to 50, so divided by three. How did we do that? It was a mix of renewable energy generation for one third of the gain, primarily solar and geothermal. And two-thirds of the gain was active energy management measures centered on HVAC, which is the biggest load, refrigeration, and lighting. Okay? We can do that in many buildings. You've heard about our new headquarters in Singapore. But I'll take the example of the uh, prime minister building in Malaysia where through a retrofit, we actually, with a new system, managed to drive down uh, the energy consumption by 40%. So we can really make a dent into our net energy needs thanks to this mix of local renewable generation and active energy management. McKinsey is doing a study showing that 80% of the potential for energy savings through active energy management are still up for grab. We will have to capture these. Now let's talk a bit about simplicity here and the need for us to make sure the channel, the value chain in this industry is able to deploy this new technology at scale. I'll mention a couple things relatively rapidly. One of them is the ability with new software to actually deploy standard architectures very rapidly. You can copy paste once you, for instance, model a hair handling unit, and you can see that in the innovation hub. You can copy paste and use it in very different architecture and in various parts of the world. So we can really make huge engineering time gains here, at least 30%. And then you can move to other phases of a project, let's say commissioning. With mobile app and full IP technology, you now have products, controllers in the buildings that can self-detect when there's an error. And so you don't have to chase each and every I.O. point, you know, going into the ceiling to check that during the commission phase. You can really make the commissioning phase much more efficient. Depending on the cases, maybe it can be 20 to 50% more efficient. So a lot of gains. Finally, we are talking about OT system integration. 
in the past, you had to do a lot of bespoke customization so that your various OT systems could talk to each other. Now, with open APIs and SDKs, you can actually do that extremely efficiently and cross data from your various systems. All right? So now let's turn to an actual example. Memberikan layanan kesehatan kelas dunia yang dapat diakses semua lapisan masyarakat menjadi prioritas utama di rumah sakit kami. Saya, Andrew Santoso, Chief Operation Officer Rumah Sakit Indriati. Rumah Sakit Indriati berlokasi di Solo Baru, Sukoharjo, yang mampu menampung hingga 500 pasien. Kami memiliki 11 ruang operasi, 2 ruang ICU, dilengkapi dengan fasilitas khusus untuk pasien kanker, jantung, syaraf, dan ortopedi. Berlokasi di area yang sedang berkembang, kadang kami mengalami kendala dengan stabilitas listrik. Tentunya bisa mengganggu pelayanan dan membahayakan pasien. Itulah kenapa kami memilih Schneider Electric dengan Eco Structure Power, agar tim engineering dan tim medis bisa tenang dalam melaksanakan tugasnya. Eco Structure Power terkoneksi dengan UPS dan trafo isolasi kami. Sistem monitoringnya memberikan informasi secara real-time mengenai kondisi listrik saat ini, sehingga kami bisa memantau dan memastikan semuanya berjalan dengan baik. Eco Structure Building membantu kami dalam memberikan kenyamanan dan melakukan penghematan energi. Melalui aplikasi, kami bisa memantau sistem HVAC, pencahayaan, dan jaringan listrik, serta menganalisa penggunaan energi di seluruh rumah sakit. Kami memilih Schneider Electric sebagai partner karena didukung tenaga ahli yang handal dan solusi yang terintegrasi. Dengan keunggulan ini, kami bisa lebih fokus untuk meningkatkan produktivitas dan pelayanan yang terbaik untuk pasien. This hospital in Indonesia, what we can see is certainly a focus on the patient safety through the reliability of power and comfort, thanks to the HVAC and lighting control system, um, but also energy efficiency. So that's one example. You know, it's not only in Australia or in the US uh, that this transformation is happening. How do we do? all these new technology rollout in buildings, and what is it about? So for us, of course, it's about ecostructure. Ecostructure for building. So here you see the, th the three stacks of our platform in the building environment. We start with our connected products. So we, of course, build on a very strong legacy and history in electrical distribution, as you see on the right part and of building automation that you see on the left part. So a breadth of product that is fairly unmatched. Then we have our edge control, which is very, very important. Of course, with some of the leading platforms, building operation, power monitoring expert, and power SCADA. What is really important here is how much we can integrate across various systems at the OT level. And finally, we've talked about it. The apps and analytics are very important for the future because that's where big data computation is happening and where progressively you're going to see more and more machine learning and artificial intelligence. That is what is driving the insight we never had in the past. And here we have a pretty broad range because we want to bring to market some of the best enterprise analytics. And on top of that, we also want to work with other companies and startups to enrich the breadth of micro applications in buildings. We won't be able to do everything by ourselves. That's actually what I want to highlight on this platform. So first, lots of launches. You see the level of innovation we have. All of these bricks have been either renewed, upgraded, or are brand new from 2018. But the thing that is really unique about this platform is how open it is. 
again, in buildings, nobody holds all the cards. There are various OT systems. What we need to do is learn to collaborate better. And for that, you need to promote open systems, which is what we have here with EcoStructure. We can easily, that's what you see here, connect and integrate the data of third-party products, typically IoT sensors, which is very important. The platform is scalable, future-ready. You want to have data highway that can help you gather the data for the coming years as progressively the industry figures out more micro-applications. That's why we are making the choice of the full IP architectures. We don't want to have data trapped in low bandwidth infrastructure. When you move to edge control, one of the most important thing is the ease of integration across systems. We don't do elevator management systems, but you know, one day, if you really want to have a, a true smart building in terms of managing the flow of people in high-rise towers, you will need a perfect integration between your various systems. And we do that thanks to a framework, which is actually our smart connector framework, where we expose APIs, and integrators can very easily put our system together with third-party systems. Extremely important. Scalability is key. We've talked about the global platform. Customers want the same level of experience in Jakarta, in Singapore, in New York. But it's also scalability in terms of enabling the computation of massive data. And finally, when it comes to cloud, we are doing real efforts to structure the data. The very important thing is contextualizing the data so that third party can actually extract it, leverage it. There will be lots of micro-applications. We need to enable them. So really having the most open platform in the industry is for us a fundamental intent. And I would say it's pretty much recognized by the industry analysts. So you see that with Navigant, that has a single load Schneider as a leader, and also by Verdantix in 2018 in the leading quadrant. So we are very proud of these awards. And certainly when we have a look at the number of iconic buildings that we are doing, you see some of them here. Uh, the, the Société Générale building is on the left. You see the PM's office in Malaysia. I mean, there are many iconic buildings where we are enabling the dreams of our customers. Well, I'd like to step back one second. The most important thing we want to achieve here is by making buildings smart, we want to empower people in building. That is the most important thing. Remember, we spend 80 to 90% of our lifetime in buildings, not outside, in buildings. We better make sure this environment is conducive to well-being, collaboration, efficiency, productivity, satisfaction, so that patients can heal faster in hospitals, so that guests in hotels can really enjoy their stay, so that students in universities can really focus on learning. So when we have a look at Singapore and its beautiful skyline, we're thinking, OK, buildings are a great asset here. We think about real estate prices, think about the innovation here. But fundamentally, the greatest asset is people in these buildings. How do we make sure we empower them, make them as productive and as satisfied as possible? That's really what new technology can enable and what we want to achieve in the coming years. Thank you.